Fundsmith Equity is an extremely large, popular and successful share fund. Now, what's the job of an active fund manager? It's to outperform their benchmark. The benchmark in this case is the MSCI Global Share Index. That's like a portfolio of all the largest stocks in the world. Now, if Fundsmith is doing their job properly, they will outperform that benchmark. That's why you pay them around 1% per year. But the question is, given the extreme success of the fund over the last eight years or so, will that success continue? I don't think so. So here are the reasons why. This is not a recommendation. If you want financial advice tailored to your individual circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Here's Terry Smith. He's the guy who runs the fund. He was a well-regarded equity analyst, and then in 2010, he founded Fundsmith. Here's the cumulative return on £100 if it was invested in the benchmark, which is MSCI World, or if it's invested in Fundsmith Equity since its inception in November 2010. You can see that it's outperformed on a fairly consistent basis over its entire history, and that's what's made the fund extremely popular. If we look at year-on-year -year returns instead of cumulative returns, we can see the periods during which it outperformed. The black line is the MSCI index, and the red line is Fundsmith Equity. And most of the time, there's clear blue water between the two. So the historic performance has been extremely good. Now, when people buy funds, they tend to stampede into the ones which have succeeded in the recent past. You can almost think of recent positive returns as a Pied Piper. People flock towards funds which have outperformed recently. The reason for this is that people expect that outperformance to continue. Now, when you buy one of the funds offered by Fundsmith, there are three share classes. The minimum investment on the T class and the R class is £1,000. But you can see there's a 50% difference between the management charge of the R class and the T class. If you don't make a minimum monthly investment of £100, you'll pay 50% extra in management charge. So I suspect the T class is much more popular than the R class. And of course, if you have a million pounds to spend, you don't have to make a minimum monthly investment and your management charge goes down to 0.9% per year. If you buy a cheap passive fund that tracks Fundsmith's benchmark, which is the MSCI World Index, you'd pay one-fifth of the annual fee, just 0.2% per year instead of 1% or even 1.5%. So it's just as well that Fundsmith has outperformed because they're charging five times as much as the passive fund. Let's remind ourselves how fund managers make money. Their annual revenue is just the size of the pot that they manage, that's their assets under management in pounds, multiplied by their annual fee as a percentage. Fundsmith manages £11.4 billion, and if we apply the fee on the T-class shares of 1%, that would be a revenue of £114 million a year. So the name of the game for Fundsmith is to grow their assets under management, because this increases their revenue. And because they've been outperforming their benchmark, they've done this very successfully, and the fund is growing very quickly. There's lots to love about Fundsmith. They're extremely open about their investment strategy. Some funds are accused of hugging a benchmark and being closet trackers. That's certainly not true of Fundsmith. They're an extremely active fund, and they deviate hugely from their benchmark, the MSCI World Index. Their strategy is to invest in just a small number of high-quality global growth companies. They try to turn over their stocks as little as possible, which is great because they pay very little in transaction fees. And another great thing is that they eat their own cooking. They invest their own money in their fund. So how have they outperformed their benchmark so successfully for eight years? Whenever you see a high return, it means there has to be a high risk. So what's the risk in the case of Fundsmith? What I've done here is to compare MSCI World, which is the benchmark for Fundsmith, versus Fundsmith Equity itself. And what I'm comparing here is the sector composition. Every company belongs to some sector, so it could be banks which belong to financials, or it could be luxury companies which belong to consumer discretionary, or it could be mining companies which belong to materials. What you can see is that MSCI World is spread fairly evenly across sectors, whereas Fundsmith Equity is extremely concentrated in just three different sectors. 
So whereas MSCI World has 1,656 stocks and about half of the portfolio is in the top three sectors, Fundsmith Equity only has 20 to 30 stocks and 84% of the portfolio is in the top three sectors. It's completely dominated by consumer staples, healthcare and technology. So the risk that they're taking is concentration risk. They're focusing all of the capital in just a few high quality stocks and a few sectors which they like. And there's no question about it, that is a risky strategy, but one which has certainly paid off over the last eight years. So what is their investment strategy? Top of their list is to choose high quality businesses which sustain a high return on operating capital employed, or R-O-C-E. If you look at the balance sheet of a company, the capital employed is the capital that they've raised through shares and bonds. And the return on that capital employed is how much revenue they generate, in other words, earnings before interest and tax, or EBIT, divided by the total capital employed. The number on the top is profit, and the number on the bottom is investor funds. So the companies that Fundsmith likes generate as many pounds profit per pound invested as possible. They also favour businesses whose advantages are difficult to replicate. So for example, Microsoft is one of their investments. And this is a company that has over 30,000 patents. In 2016 alone, Microsoft was granted over 2,000 patents in the US. They favour businesses which don't require significant leverage to generate those returns. What do we mean by leverage? Well, here I'm comparing two companies side by side, Google on the left and Microsoft on the right. And this is how the companies are funded. I've broken it down into shareholder equity, and beneath that you can see the debt. What really stands out is that Google is largely shareholder funded, whereas Microsoft has a much more even combination of shares and bonds. Now, equity on the balance sheet acts like a shock absorber. If the assets of the company lose money, equity absorbs those losses. And if the losses exceed the value of the equity, the company becomes bankrupt. So more equity means less credit risk, less risk of bankruptcy. And Google has a larger shock absorber than Microsoft. It's 83% equity versus 37%. So all else being equal, Fundsmith would favour the companies with the least leverage because that reduces the balance sheet risk of the company. Once a company generates a profit, it has to be reinvested back into the company or given out to shareholders. So Fundsmith likes companies which can reinvest that money at a high rate of return, because ultimately that will benefit the shareholder. One also has to consider businesses which are resilient to change, particularly given the rapid rate of technological progress. So this is what the fund managers at Fundsmith spend their nights worrying about. So for example, Pepsi, Smucker and Unilever could all be disrupted by the trend towards organic and natural and healthy food. And it's reassuring to see that Fundsmith is monitoring these situations very closely. And that's one of the benefits of having a highly concentrated portfolio. They really can look at individual stocks in incredible detail. Now the last item on their list is businesses whose valuation is considered to be attractive. In other words, you don't want to pay too much for the companies which screen well on the previous criteria. Terry Smith describes the strategy as odd. Yes, he has a sense of humour. They only invest in good companies, they don't overpay, and they do nothing. But crucially, the D for don't overpay is second. Terry Smith really stresses the fact that long-term investors should think primarily of whether they're buying a good company. If you're holding on to it for a very long time, then it'll converge to the correct fundamental price, or at least that's the theory. So this all seems great, a great fundamental strategy and a very sensible approach to investing. But the key question is whether it can continue to beat its benchmark. So let's ask ourselves: if a fund outperforms today, how likely is it statistically to outperform in five years time? S&P runs a survey in the United States which has been tracking active funds for precisely this consistency of performance. Now, if a fund manager is skillful, they should consistently outperform their peers, which means that the successful funds today will be successful for a long time to come. Unfortunately, that simply isn't the case. 
If we look at the top 25% performing funds in March 2013, four years later, only 1% of the funds were still in the top quarter of performance. That means that it's much more likely to have been luck than skill, which made them outperform in the first place. Because luck doesn't last, but skill does. So this is why the odds are stacked against Fundsmith outperforming in the long term. It's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. I like to draw an analogy with a panda. This has evolved to eat bamboo at a particular altitude in a particular mountain range in China. For millions of years it flourished, but as its habitat changed, the panda became endangered because it was tuned to one specific niche. If we look at the history of policy rates from central banks over the last 60 years, you can see that over the last 10 years we've had zero interest rates. And in that kind of environment, Fundsmith has flourished. But rather like the panda, the worry is that Fundsmith will not perform so well as the cost of funding for companies increases. Terry Smith has a witty retort for this. This is something he said when people noticed that there was a stock rotation away from the sectors which he favours. He says he has no way of knowing whether this rotation will continue, but neither do any of the analysts or commentators who are involved in opining on the matter. Well, of course that's true. We don't know what's going to happen to rates. But one thing we do know is that for certain they're going to change. They will rise as the global recovery carries on. And the concern is that Fundsmith will not be able to evolve quickly enough to cope with the change. And it may be a victim of economic habitat loss, rather like the giant panda. The platform Hargreaves Lansdowne controversially excluded Fundsmith from its Wealth 150 list which it reserves for exceptional managers. The reason given was that Hargreaves has concerns over how performance may be affected when defensive sectors begin to lag. They're also concerned that Terry Smith's track record is relatively short. Remember, eight years is less than one business cycle, which is usually a decade. And some fund managers have performed well through several business cycles. And in particular, Hargreaves is worried about an environment of prolonged falling share prices which of course will come. The size of the fund is also a concern. It now manages £11.4 billion. If it only has 29 stocks and it splits its allocation equally, that's about £400 million per stock. Of the 70 or so funds which match its criteria, Choice Hotels is one of the smallest and its market cap, which is the total value of all of its shares, is only £3 billion. So in other words, Fundsmith would own almost 10% of the company. So as the fund continues to grow, it's simply becoming too big to buy some of the small funds which tend to grow most quickly. So its own success will be a drag on returns over the long term. Do you agree with us that Fundsmith is unlikely to outperform long term? Do you think the economic environment is going to change and that Fundsmith won't be able to evolve fast enough to cope with that change? If you want to learn more about active fund management versus passive, then why not work with us? You could book a power hour with Romin, or you could enrol for one of our courses. Remember, you can always tweet us at PensionCraft, message us on Facebook, and if you like these videos, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel?